So that we, okay, well, welcome to, we're gonna go ahead and start. We'll have a few more join us, I'm sure. But we wanna welcome you all to our business during hours, which is our virtual platforms that we get to talk to members of our community and business owners that we might not normally get to talk to. Um, so we appreciate Sheriff Darren Campbell being on today. And these are just 30 minute informal conversations with folks in our community. And we're gonna get the city on the next one, uh, Ralph. They're coming up soon. Um, and we appreciate uh, you, Sheriff, being here and talking. And again, it's very informal. So if you have questions, just chat it in the chat box and we'll get an answer for you. But without further ado, I'm gonna just turn it over to our sheriff and uh, give us an update on how the sheriff's office is. Can I tell you one quick story? So I used to say sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Brunswick County, Sheriff Ingram, who Darren knows really well, he says, it's office, not department. <laughs> so oh, he was real intentional and because it's an elected position and it, it's, you know, it's a little different than an actual department. So I'm always really careful to say that it's an office. So because it is a well, office that you do. So thank you for being here. Absolutely. And as I told Shannon, I hope the internet holds up. Like I say, some of y'all, I'm, I'm sort of working off a laptop. So we had some upgrades here. And I'll tell you, when I say upgrades, I mean, my whole wall had to be changed because it got water. We got flooded here not long ago. So I'll be very quick. Well, not quick, but I do like the informal side of it. And I do appreciate you having me. And uh, some of those that don't know me, which here, everybody really looks familiar. But a little bit about my background is, I started, like everybody else, in high school. I ended up uh, growing up working on forklifts uh, and a diesel mechanic for my dad. My brother still runs a business over on Oakland Avenue, Dane. Uh, everybody that knows Dane. But uh, I got in the ride-along program, and sort of law enforcement got the bug. Uh, I come on as a reserve officer, and I'm not going to tell my age, but somewhere probably around 94. Um, and was blessed enough to be able to work through K-9 Division, our interstate criminal enforcement, and uh, – a major of our criminal investigation, which has served me well because with departments or different division supervisors, lieutenants coming to me, I can always say I've done your job. So it, it really helps me a lot. And Shannon, you're exactly right. Uh, for years, I was always said sheriff's department, never knew any different. And the reason is, is, you know, in Iredell County, our sheriff's office here is over 220 years old. A little bit of quick history up until about 1834, the sheriff was appointed by the county courts. After 1834, and in the original Constitution of North Carolina and the second rewrite in 1868, there was always a provision for the elected sheriff and coroner uh, and House of Representatives, but we no longer have a coroner. So the sheriff is the oldest and the only constitutionally mandated elected office in local government. And that means your commissioners and things and registers and things of that nature. So that's sort of where it comes from here locally. And I'm a history person. So I do, I try to collect a lot of that stuff from the sheriff's office through the years, but it's just hard to do because when years pass, when sheriffs leave, they usually take things with them. It's not like it is now as far as the records retention and records and things like that. So obviously I'm blessed to be here by the citizens of Idaho. I was put here in 2018, was lucky enough to get reelected, which was, we didn't have a lot of opposition then. Well, we didn't have none then, but I'm, I'm blessed for that. But Currently, a little bit of the sheriff's office, we have over 291 employees this full-time. A lot of people don't understand we're that big. Our budget runs somewhere around $30 million. Uh, we have grown just a lot with the cost of living and the cost of everything else, trying to attract good employees into the sheriff's office. We are very competitive, in our, our, especially as far as law enforcement. Uh, we compete with states. Well, I love Chief Addison and Chief C. down in Mooresville, Troutman, but here where we're at, we do a lot of competition with Mecklenburg, Forsyth County, Catawba County. So we try to recruit the top tier officers. We work well with our commissioners, try to get pay up. We've still got a ways to go to be able to attract those deputies. And as everybody's seen, it's a tough time to be in law enforcement. Uh, we started seeing that back in Ferguson. Uh, it's always been an issue, but law enforcement has always tried to adapt and overcome. Uh, as far as I think people ask me, well, when we get into community policing, was sheriffs to get elected, they've always had to do it because we only get our job when we, we have the support of our community. And uh, so we've been blessed with that, blessed with good community members that has always supported us. We don't have the issues here that's happening somewhere. And we'll get in a little bit and a, a little bit, but let me give you some of the things a lot of people's interested about is our crime statistics. You know, Idle County's uh, just grown. Our population somewhere right around, uh, give or take, about 182,000 in the county. We obviously are statutorily responsible for the jail, courts, civil, 
and our common law is law enforcement services throughout the all of the unincorporated parts of the county. And we also can, we have jurisdiction inside the city, but we usually allow other than law enforcement services to be conducted by the police departments. We conduct on the other hand, civil, as you go back to where statutory, we're required to handle civil things. And that's such as your evictions, your writ of possessions, a lot of your domestic violence orders, the sheriffs, that's the reason you see the sheriffs serving or in the city a lot of times, serving papers because statutorily we're empowered, we have to handle the civil and obviously the courthouse and the security of the courthouse. But one thing that I'm, I'm very happy about, when you hear me refer to UCRs, UCR is a report card for law enforcement, and it, it stands for Uniform Crime Reporting. It doesn't matter how big the agency is. It doesn't matter how small. It's a victimization adjusted chart. So over the last decade, the, the crime in Iowa County, as far as extrapolate the city, Troutman, and, and Mooresville, has reduced over 50% even while our, our population has grown, which is unbelievable. Over the last four years when, since we've been elected or, or since everybody here, and listen, it's not just me, it's the guys that work for me, the guys and gals, they, they do the hard work. But I, we're, we're, we're lucky enough to say that we had a 32% reduction in our index crimes. Index is property crime, our, our motor vehicle theft, break-ins. Uh, it can even be total as rape, murder, armed robbery, those type of crime is a total index. Our property crime has went down by 32%, while our index crime, which is your seven most violent, has reduced by 29%, I believe it's right, but our overall violent murders and robberies has reduced by 5.6%, and, and we never had high rates of that anyway, so for us, that's a huge reduction in our violent crimes. Uh, and the UCRs are based on a population of 100,000. So five years ago, 2,100 people out of every 100,000 was a victim of these seven crimes, the violent crimes. Now we're less than 1,000 victims per 100,000. And that, hence your 50% reduction uh, in a lot, of, a lot of that. Our violent crime rate there, again, is used to be around 242 people out of 100,000. Now you're less than 160. And we don't see a lot of it. But the property crime... A lot of people, you know, we do a lot of roundups. I know you see it. We do a lot of drug roundups. We try to do two a year. I've said in every time we've ever done one of those that we're not after the addicts. We're not after the ones that are addicted. We're after, we'll give anybody help. I've said that in a press release. We'll help anybody that comes to us. But you can't sell drugs to support your, your habit. We have, we have done a lot of stuff over the last couple of years. I think we've had about six roundups. And, and here's why it's beneficial. We understand that all crimes have about a 71 to 76 percent nexus to drugs so if we make it hard on the people dealing the drugs locally we build up such by doing these roundups we build up such a distrust in their customer base that those customers that are normally break in to support their habit and go to these dealers to buy they leave our cities and they leave our counties they go to other places and that's where we, we're so hard on but that also attributes to 32 percent reduction in our crime because no longer are they stealing here nor breaking in, nor committing as many robberies because they know we're a lot more strict on the enforcement of it. And that's a question I get a lot of times. Uh, that's just one aspect of it. Another aspect is is we're really strong, and I'm very, I, I have, and I didn't say this in my introduction, I have a uh, one in elementary school, a child, one in middle school, and a daughter going to early college, so I see all of it. But the SROs and the law enforcement presidents, especially in our elementary schools, has been unbelievable. It's not just, it's not just active shooter threats. It's it's drug education. It's a uh, suicide prevention. It's basically building a relationship up with a second grader that when they grow up, they'll remember the interaction they had with law enforcement. We have one of the only mobile classrooms in the state. In fact, I think it's the only mobile classroom in the state. Totally bought with drug dealers' money. And now I hope my I hope my internet's still working. It looks it's giving me a flash up. You still hear me? Okay, okay, cool beans. We uh, I fund that position with a, a deputy by the name of Ben Hardy. Uh, he has a dog named Tito, which has been. Let me tell you, this dog does nothing but lay on its back and get rubbed. We went to the parade in Mooresville, and usually we throw candy. We walk. I had more of them throw candy back to the dog. So. But people say, well, why is the dog? We was the first one that had one. And the reason is, is I want to take that officer and that dog and use that canine as a tool for that first grader, second grader, or third grader to, to relate with the officer. 
Christ Center mentioned, we have a lot of issues for what may be called to a disruptive student. It, it can be young students. You take the dog in and have that dog present with you. It's unbelievable how the emotion changes and how the, the change in the student, they just relate so much to those animals. Uh, we, we really worked hard. We've always had a presence in our high school and our middle school as far as SROs. But last year was the first year that we were really able to get them in our elementary. I would have loved to have it in all of our elementary schools. The money was not there. We, we worked for it. But we do have each one of our elementary schools that split an SRO. And they're, they're geographically, the way we do it geographically, the closest two schools sells an SRO. And at the same time, and getting a little bit of the different divisions here in a little bit, we, we require those SROs to visit these schools, but also our patrol deputies. Hey, if you're, if you're riding down the road or if you've got a report, go sit in the parking lot. Uh, stop by and see the lunch lady. Stop by and eat lunch with a child, sit in a car rider line. It, it serves many purposes. One is building a relationship, but the other is a deterrent. We know that officer presence is the number one deterrent in any type of crime. So the more those officers are there, the more present they are, uh, in the schools and at the schools, the lot more chance we have to reduce any kind of attack or something bad happening. Uh, now with social media, it's so easy for information to be distributed amongst many. And if we don't have those relationships with these young children's children, they can communicate. But if we don't have those relationships, we will never know what's going to happen the next day at school. Teachers, principals, we have good relationships and, and us as law enforcement. But if you have the trust of the children who will trust you enough to relay that information. They may have heard of a, a bullying situation. They may have heard of an active shooter threat. That has been immense for us as far as getting ahead of these things. And a lot of times you'll see it on social media or somebody will text me, hey, I've seen this. Does this involve us? And most likely we've already got it. And obviously I encourage anybody to report it, but us and Chief and the Chief and Moore have been very good at working to make sure our schools are safe. Uh, we did use asset forfeiture last year or the year before to place ballistic shields at every one of our elementary schools. The reason it's there is for one, if they have to do a hallway clearing or get kids out of a certain room, it's there. It's also for that first responding deputy to not be able to, we can't sit back at a car and wait no more. We can't sit back and wait to back up and get there. They have to be the initial person that goes in. And uh, we, we've done a lot of training in heaven forbid if anything like that happened we have had a shooting on an elementary school property here back in i think it was 20 <clears throat> excuse me 2015 i believe and i'm gonna tell you it hit close to home because my wife and all three of my kids were on the playground when the shooting happened uh thank goodness it was a domestic well it's no good but it was a domestic and the threat was towards one person and not a lot but still it scares you that a shooting happened on the grounds of an elementary school and a weapon was there uh so a little bit about that, and I'll, I'll hit a little bit in the SROs in a minute, but let me give you an overview of some of our divisions. Uh, our patrol division is usually what we would see. We see our patrol division patrolling every day, and some of the stuff they've got, we cover right around 598 square miles of property within Idle County. Uh, some of it, like within the city, is civil, domestic, and things like that. But that averages out to about one deputy on night shift any given time. You'll have one deputy per about 82 square miles. Okay, and, and to give you an idea of some of these areas that they work and are assigned to, our north end, we use I-40 and I-77 to split it. So our north end guy would basically cover 77 Midway Road to, that would be Alexander and Wilkes County over to Yakin. So that gives an idea how these deputies, how, how our response time is a little different from the city. And, you know, we try to keep a five to seven minute response time, uh, but that's tough when you're covering that many miles. Uh, we're in a city or a little closer. But to give you some of the ideas, that their, their essential duties, check check the schools. Have a presence in your neighborhood. On churches, I have the deputy's car be seen in the churches riding through the parking lot during service. Uh, deters threats. We've seen a lot of that. And last year, just our patrol division traveled over 984,000 miles in Idaho County. And that sounds, you know, that's a lot. And I say, well, you know, it's, it's not a million, but when you drive that much gas for that many cars, <laughs> That, that's unbelievable, and they do. They All criminal law, motor vehicle laws, license checks, uh, we see a lot of that, and people will say, well, why, why are you doing a, a license check here? And the reason I do it is to let the bad guys know that we're in your neighborhood, then they move somewhere else. That's one of the reasons, and uh, we do that. So 
but they are assigned to each patrol zone. We have one deputy per patrol zone. We have a sergeant and a lieutenant, and he is governed by a captain major and then falls directly under chief deputy myself. We do have a canine on each one of our patrol divisions. We also have two blood bloodhounds, which are utilized mostly for our Alzheimer's, our dementia patients, or our missing children that we do use that a lot. So we have a huge, right now I think we have 14 canines. We're the oldest, one of the oldest canine units in the state and the second oldest interstate criminal enforcement team in the states. And uh, so that's some of the, some of the interesting points. Uh, the next one you heard me refer to, <coughs> excuse me, is our civil division. Our civil division has a lieutenant, sergeant, and five different civil officers. Their main jobs is exactly what it says. It's civil. It's uh, our tax warrants, our writ of executions, uh, levies or judgments in bank accounts. They are responsible. You wouldn't think of that as deputies, but statutorily, that's some of the responsibility they have to levy or to satisfy judgment for somebody who didn't pay, didn't pay their taxes, or one of those things. Even it's one of the, the, the jobs that I don't like. It's one of the things that statutorily we're required to do. Uh, levy and evictions and obviously our domestic violence orders is a lot of that we 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 commonly refer to them as a 50b order those deputies and and others are responsible uh, for making sure those things are serviced on a timely manner uh just a little bit of numbers how they are they they get assigned over 2900 cases and this is just summonses for example their service rate was almost 999.92 percent so they do a good job at serving serving their civil papers and things of that nature Excuse me. Another thing we see, and, and this is you see a lot on the news, and we've sort of been ahead of it for years, and we've done it, uh, is our community policing program. We have three different community policing programs inside Idle County. Uh, the way the way I'm going to do it, it's a philosophy of full service, personalized policing. That's the way I like to call it. We are in the customer service business. No matter what nobody says, we we are in the customer service business to take care of our customers, which are the taxpayers of the county. It's not just to lock up the bad people. It's also to help victims of crime. It's, it's the bullying. It's the kids. It's the older ladies that's been scammed or identity theft. So we're, we try to be pretty much full service. Uh, <clears throat> our community police, like I said, we have three of them, and, and their job is a lot. It branches off. You'll see our motorcycles. We do have three motorcycles that we patrol with, uh, not necessarily every day, uh, but they do operate out of our community police and model in, in Mooresville. And also we have a lake patrol division that operates out of the southern part of the county. With having the huge man-made lake, the largest man-made state uh, lake in the state of North Carolina, that has been something that we have been trying to grow because anybody that's been, brought, been down Brawley School Road or anywhere in the lake, I can respond to calls on the lake faster from a boat than a lot of the times I can from a car. Uh, You've seen the drownings and you've seen the lake incidents we've had. We have really tried to increase our service time on that. We we're capable of now we use the drone. We actually have two drones that we use for lake operations and land operations. But it's sort of it makes the most sense to utilize it down there. And we've had great luck with that and the lake patrol, uh, the cops units. And you heard me speak about the eight hundred thousand miles on the other the patrol division and this in addition those guys down there have driven over 155,000 miles in just one year and uh, you know over a, probably about 7,000 calls they handle down there. Uh, really with the lake troll I sort of covered that but I will tell you this we're very unique we also people forget Lake Lookout. We have parts of Lake Lookout which border Catawba and Alexander. We travel down Catawba River. We have all this side of the Catawba River and then all the way obviously in Idle County side of the lake and down into Mecklenburg and we work a lot with those those uh different counties and marine and the lake normal marine commission and we do a lot of stuff in the careless and reckless boating lake enforcement uh spot checks and i'll tell you this and we've really not rolled it out we're sort of doing a uh, i guess just seeing how it's going to work we're sort of trying we want to start and it's going to sound weird when i say it is issue children citations so everybody I look at me but when i say citations here's what i'm talking about we will let kids know if we catch them, if, if, if it, listen, we may see them in the boat doing a boat or safety. They may be at a boat landing. They may just come through and see an officer at Chick-fil-A. But we want to issue them a little citation that says, you've been caught. We won't have such things as sitting in your car seat, having your flotation device on, wearing your seat belt, being respectful. So we've got some community partners we're trying to roll that out with that, you know, you may go somewhere and get a free cup of ice cream if you're caught by a deputy doing these things. Uh, you may get to go to a, a local zoo and feed the animals for free. So that is something that we're really trying to work to build these relationships with these kids, not just SROs, not just in the school, but also 
we're planning ahead for this COVID and, and whatever happens with the kids being out. Another thing that you'll see is we have a warrant service division. Uh, that Basically, that division used to, that process used to fall on the patrol, and it still does to an extent, but Iredell County's population has grown so much, we actually have a warrant division consisting of three or four, I think it's four, we've got one opening right now, that we receive papers and warrants and warning persons and service of criminal summons from the process, from our judicial system, and they're responsible for serving those papers. And some of the some of the different types of warrants is orders for arrest, which is really for failing to appear, warrants for arrest, even governor's warrants and fugitive warrants we serve uh, here. And uh, last year just served over 2,300 warrants for arrest and over 1,700 calls for service uh, and over 190 papers per deputy. So that's a that's a a division that they work hard. You don't hear a lot about it, and they drove almost 50,000 miles last year. Getting to one of my favorites, even though I never was an SRO, I think our SRO division is one of the best things. And I'm going to tell you, I can't say hats off enough to the guys and gals that work at division above and beyond. Obviously, COVID has changed a lot of the way we do our schools. Uh, usually on our summertime is the time they get their in-service training, all their up-to-date legal stuff for their, their school. But in March, when the schools sort of never went back, they had to adapt, you know, you still got kids that need help. You still got kids that like seeing the officer. So we really tried to be a come to your house type of service. They try to participate in birthday parties to keep these kids connected. Uh, they will go to the schools for the staff and the, the principals and the administration. Everybody's there and continue on. Uh, but ours, they're all active shooter certified and everything of that nature. And they'll, they're good to go in our schools and, and, and all that. So sorry, that's my walk in the door. Uh, our criminal warrant division. Say you. Sorry, I had to tell my daughter bye. She's going to the pool, so she's stuck heading. Uh, our canine unit, we have over 14 canines, like I said, within division. And there again, two bloodhounds, the other are patrol dogs. We do everything from dementia patient, Alzheimer patient, missing children, and suspect apprehension. Uh, a lot of training on that. That's a division that I come from. I was a former dog handler with a bloodhound and a patrol dog in my earlier days. And we constantly utilize them. Uh, and uh, they work, and that also has some of those that works our criminal enforcement team. And just last year or so far, they was able to seize over $270 million, I'm sorry, $270,000 in cash last year and almost $7 million in drugs uh, and one of the largest methamphetamine and pill seizures in North Carolina last year. So that's been great. Our investigations division. Can't say hats off enough to these guys. The the state average for clearing a criminal investigation is about 27%. The last three years run, we've cleared over 60% of our criminal investigations, and that's patrol. That that involves our, our narcotics division, our special victims unit, which is in charge of our child sex crimes, our elder abuse cases. I am very pro specialization. You know, I go to my doctor for my physicals, my blood work, and all that. But if I want to have heart surgery, I want to go to one that knows what he's doing. So, therefore, I try to really keep established specialized units. And uh, that's really important with identity theft. Now, cybercrime is one of the biggest things we're seeing come about, uh, especially with our elder population. But it's a lot easier. They're not going to get on here like we are on Zoom. They're not going to text a lot. They're going to come into the office. And to have an investigator that specializes in that type of identity theft and those type of bank account issues has been 100% beneficial for us and, and Iredell and Iredell County in general. And those crimes, our cyber crimes, has grown almost year over year to about 62%. I mean, that's growing. And if we have a bad year to where a couple of years, my first year was we had all the tax uh, returns that was stolen. You know, we, that is a federal type crime, but by having these divisions here, they're able to give them the paperwork and we're able to cut the time off for the recovery of money almost six weeks. So that, that has been good. Uh, a new position, I think uh, Brunswick County and maybe Carteret County has the other ones, is we actually established, I took one of the investigators and uh, reestablished as a threat, invest, a threat assessment detective. His main job, probably about 70% of his threats and assessment of our schools as uh, far as valid threat, online threats, anything of that nature. They have really been doing a lot of that. They do church safety assessment, assessment, that's a tongue twister, assessment, uh, and they're also in charge of teaching. We do a lot of classes until COVID, and you've seen an active shooter, surviving active shooter, uh, our church shield, our faith watch, 
to help our churches understand what happens in a situation of an active shooter. And I wish I had these numbers right before, but I'll tell you the last ones. Uh, we've sort of done, I think we were before COVID got, are doing around our 220th congregation just on our church shield side. So that, that was, that's been unbelievable. Uh, and really in the end, I think closing up before we get the questions and, and we could talk a lot about, it, I think the one thing we're really seeing now is, is COVID has changed a lot. And one thing we can't forget, we're housing, you know, almost 300 prisoners and the, the, the detention facility and, and the detention facility was well overdue. We were spending about a hundred thousand dollars a month in out of County housing on prisoners. But the, the beneficial thing when that thing opened, we're able to keep isolated places. So knock on wood is we, we have yet to have a COVID case inside the jail, even though we're housing close to 300. We have, we've done real good with our isolation, our quarantine, uh, you come in there, you're automatically quarantined for 14 days. Uh, every officer that comes in has their temperature checked twice. Uh, they come in, we're masked. We do use masks in there just because of the safety. It's two risks in these closed, confined areas. And being able to do two-man pod control, which is basically, they have a pod, but they're isolated to their rooms until they're they're allowed out for food and exercise and things of that nature. Uh, so that's where we're sort of at with the jail. Uh, the next thing I think is is sort of going along with the same thing with COVID is our arrest and bring them in. We've got some agencies that's had their whole investigative divisions wiped out for quarantine time. So that's something we really try to take advantage of this, like you are with the Zoom meetings and anywhere else, to make sure that this is the way, this is a new way of doing business. We are equipped technologically. Every car I can do this with, uh, every one of our patrol cars, we can do Zoom meetings. Uh, every one of our cars, a Wi-Fi, every car is basically like an office and i'm so glad that the commissioner supported us in getting that type of technology in place so now you know the old days of coming to get a paperwork and taking it to north idol no longer we have that we email everything from our cars and it keeps the deputies in our in the zones and it helps us so much be stay in our areas and reduce crime um uh, and before I finish, I guess the another thing is we see a lot is downtown, especially with y'all, some of the businesses downtown and what's been going on. I can tell you so far, there's been a, Shannon and I were speaking before the uh, before we started, is this is sort of to be a small group of people for a little bit. Then it has grown to other people with different groups and different things they want to protest. Uh, I know it's been an impact and up until the last couple nights, we've not seen a lot of issues with it, but uh, you know, just, I think the business owners I've spoken with on us, they understand where we're at. You know, we don't want to create more of a problem and we everybody has the first amendment right to do certain things. But once it gets disorderly and once they're interfering with everything, I think last night proved the point that the chief over in States will ignore us or want to tolerate this type of behavior. You know, we understand, we understand peaceful protests. We understand every side being heard. But there's a, there's a toleration level that we cannot that we we're just not able to, to go above and over and uh, that's up to them. So far, it's been good. We've had respect. We've had communication. And there again, I can't stand up about the community. You know, you, you, we can never you know small group, no matter who it is, no matter where it's from, can't speak for everybody. And I think from what we've seen from a law enforcement perspective, has has been good because you know on both sides. You know, the, the protest we've seen, I, I honestly felt good when they pick up the phone and call, hey, Sheriff, here's what's going to happen. A lot of people in the community, is, it's, it's been good. We, we are in a good place uh, where we're at. Now, going forward, can we tell, I worry a lot more about the people from away from here. They come in and, uh, you know, they don't have no vetted interest here locally, but want to make sure that they get their opportunity to speak on a national level at the, you know, taking advantage of us. And we'll see if that's to come yet but i can assure you this uh, david asked him and him has become a good friendship i think I, some weekends i talk to david more than i do my wife uh, there's nothing for us to text back and forth in fact tomorrow we're going to lunch uh, we do a lot of communication we open up a lot of services for the city to use that we have and and one thing away from sort of this is we actually have a crime scene well we have crime scene units and that's something but we actually have a lab here locally you know, years ago, you heard about the lab that was doing a lot of toxicology, a lot of blood testing. But we got out of that business for one, it was competing with private business, which I don't think government should ever compete with private business. So now what we're doing is crime scene process stuff that, that benefits us on a criminal enforcement side and solving crimes and giving victims justice. 
is our our labs working. We have specialized. We have a crime, the, the lieutenant over there is level six, I believe, crime scene process. And that's one of the highest levels in the state. There's one of five or six in the state. And, uh, you know, we give that service free to the city and, and try to help them if they have an issue with fingerprints. You know, we don't have to wait for Raleigh for a year now to get our fingerprints back. I can tell you within about six hours, who's, most of the time, if we can get a good print, that type of stuff. And we've used a lot, especially for a lot of vandalism cases. Uh, but they, they do a lot. And the lab, I, that is something I'm proud of is the lab. You know, we want to continue to grow it. But I can tell now the direction is going to take a lot more cyber side of it. We do have a forensic video enhancement division over there that we've added on to that if we have crimes on computers, if we have crimes on phones, we can actually download that information and use it in the pro prosecution of cases. And that is something that normally we would not have been able to do. We have a, I wish I could remember the exact name of it, basically SBI, the Child Abuse Task Force. We actually have a certified officer in there with a the software where we can go and we don't have to wait on the state no more. We can get that information now. We have somebody certified to basically bring justice here now, get them into the Dove House, help the interviews, and be able to get the uh, district attorney the evidence she needs for a successful prosecution without having to wait four or five years, you know, and, and a lot of that goes. So some of our other smaller units is, is you know, we hear training, training division. Just for the deputies here, we can we, we train almost 26,000 man hours a year just to keep our certifications up and and obviously I, I i agree and you know crisis intervention training a lot of things that were not mandated that we do here crisis intervention mobile field force training officer survival training uh dealing with uh, like i said our sros they're, they're all been certified with this active shooter tr type training is, is, is it just helps the citizen here a long way uh i Totally made a point of always being able to offset taxpayer dollars with drug seizure money. We've spent a probably two to three million, somewhere right around there, in equipment. And in our budgets over the last couple of years, we've been able to turn back almost fourteen million dollars in return revenue. A lot of that went to the jail, but a lot of it is just good managing. You know, I, I'm one of those that I expect if you're going to work eight hours a day, you get paid for eight hours, but you're not getting paid for eight and working for three. Uh, I'm one of those, if we see a software issue here, maintenance on it may be extremely expensive. We call and we work out deals. So that's translating us to saving so much money and turn back our budget and our revenues that we receive on things such as gun permits. So with that, I want to close because I want to make sure, and I sort of said I was going to keep track of the time, but I really didn't pay attention to what time I did start. So let me go whatever you need, questions. Uh, I'll try to address. There's a lot of it that we can go uh, – you know, a lot of jail stuff, a lot of others. It's a huge organization, but only so much time. So I'm open to anything. Well, we, you, we touched on the um, question that we had in the chat room, which was about the protest, um, on handling the protest on county property. Um, did anybody else want to type in a question or ask a question of the sheriff? This is your time. Well, while someone's thinking, I did have a question. Um, on, the kind okay. of, on the county crime rates, are those, do those, those are just the county. It doesn't include the city or the towns, correct? Yes, we extrapolate out for the, the UCRs. There's a way in there to extrapolate out the service of the city because some of it's confusing because they handle the criminal enforcement side of investigations, but we handle the civil and domestic violence side. So what I do is we extrapolate out for those populations and for those, and, and also to give hats off to them, their crime rate has plummeted as well. And a lot of it is the aggressive stance. You know, you've got to take it, and I hate to say it, you know, sometimes in a lot of you hear huggy feely things work sometimes, but those that are career repeat offenders, they're not going to buy by that. You just got to have a strong, you got to sit down good and make sure you lay it out what it is, what you're willing to tolerate and not. And obviously with those reductions in number for us and the city has been, has been, has been great. Well, um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I just want to thank you again, unless there's anything else you wanted to wrap up on. Well, let me ask Mary, Mary I seen the handle the protest on county property. It is county property. We do sort of, even within the city, we, I'd respect the chief enough. It's on county property. It's inside the city. We work together closely. Uh, I don't want to give out a lot of our security stuff here since it will be posted, but we are constantly 24 seven aware of everything that goes on over there. Uh, we have manpower strategically placed in different ways. You may not always see it, but it's there. And if you notice in a lot of your videos, it's suddenly how the deputies show up when I talk about those square miles. It's not coincidentally that the deputies show up in every one of those videos because we, we strategically place face to be there for both. 
not only for the business, but also for the protesters. We want everybody to remain safe. But that's how we do it. Uh, communications with the city between ourselves has, has been great. And, and even today and t- last night we were talking on the phone. I met the chief up there last night. I think we were out there till I won't say after 10 o'clock. But the communications, working together, we give each other space. We know our strong points and what we can do and uh, what, what assets we have to bring to bear if we have to. Well, again, thank you, Shara. We appreciate you giving your time today. And if there's anything we can do at the chamber or as a community, you just let us know as well, okay? Hey, same to y'all. Everybody's got my number. I know Brian does. I see him get in there. So anything y'all need, hey, you call me anytime. Uh, you can get a hold of me, Shannon, y'all, and Mr. Tomlin, you sure can. Uh, just give me a call. I'll be glad, okay? All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Shara. Thank you. Yep, thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you.